Welcome back uh, to the second uh, half of my uh, video tribute to uh, Sir William Ulock. Uh, today I want to concentrate on the man himself. Uh, in the last uh, video we talked about uh, the Mulock estate, of course, and a little bit about the man, but today I want to concentrate on Sir William himself. Sir William, uh, as most of you know, uh, was nicknamed the, uh, the Grand Old Man of Canada, uh, but he was much, much more. Uh, if you take a look at uh, what he did over his 101 years, yeah, that's right, 101 years of life, uh, he was uh, a lawyer, he was a businessman, an educator, a farmer, a politician, a judge, and uh, he was a philanthropist as well. So he had a fairly full life. Uh, I would say he was close to uh, being a Renaissance man as uh, you can be. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about this amazing man and uh, sort of the unique um, elements to his personality. So I'm hoping that you, uh, you're you going to enjoy this, uh, this look back at the man. Now, uh, Sir William Mulock, um, wasn't born in Newmarket. He was born in uh, Bond Head, but uh, his uh, family was deeply rooted into to Newmarket. His mother was a coffer, and uh, the coffers were uh, had married into uh, the first settlers that came to Newmarket, and so uh, his mother was well. Uh, entrenched in, in Newmarket history long before Sir William uh, came along. So let's talk a little bit about where uh, Sir William uh, came from. Uh, his father was a doctor. Uh, his name was Thomas Holman Mulock, and he had emigrated uh, from Ireland to Canada and had uh, set up his practice in, as I say, Bonhead, and had along the way he had uh, married uh, Mary uh, Cothra, who, uh, as I say, was uh, from one of the leading families in uh, Newmarket. Uh, many of you will remember the Cothra name because uh, um, they eventually uh, went to Toronto where they made their name. Uh, the Cothras became one of the richest families, uh, not only in Canada, but in North America. Uh, so. Uh, that itself is, uh, is fairly impressive, but uh, not nearly as impressive as uh, Sir William and the, uh, the life that he led in 101 years. So as I say, um, Sir William was was buried, or was sorry, was buried. Was, uh, Sir William was uh, was born in uh, in Bonhead in 1843, and. Uh, his father, as I say, was a doctor there, a uh, fairly uh, well-known doctor in the area. And, uh, but unfortunately, uh, four, when uh, Sir William was four years of age, um, his father passed and uh, his mother was left with, with three children uh, that she was going to need to raise. And so, you know, as one would expect, uh, she decided that she would return to Newmarket, where her people were, um, to raise the children. And so, um, after 1847, um, she returned to Newmarket, and uh, Sir William uh, became part of uh, Newmarket, to, of Newmarket community with his uh, with his family. Now, uh, people always uh, ask me where did they move to and uh, for those people who uh, know the historic houses of Newmarket you probably know that the Cother home is still uh, located on Pearson Street uh, across the road from uh, where the old high school was and uh, so you know if you're out for a walk when we're, we're able to get out and go for a walk in public uh, you should take a look at the house uh, as I say it's still there uh, quite historic obviously uh, not only because it was the Coffer House, but because uh, uh, this was the childhood uh, home of uh, Sir William. Now, Sir William attended school here in Newmarket. And uh, 
for those of you who, uh, again, uh, have wandered around Newmarket and taken a look at some of the historic buildings, uh, this particular uh, building is the uh, Grammar School, which is located on Millard Avenue. Uh, and uh, this building as well is still there. Uh, the Grammar uh, School was, I guess you would say, the equivalent of the high school uh, before we had high schools. Before the, uh, they created the high school system here in Ontario, uh, we, you went off to a grammar school, which is basically where uh, you went uh, for your schooling previous to your opportunity to go to, to university if you, if you chose to. Uh, it's kind of funny if you read the, the uh, what people had to say about Sir William when he was just William Mulock uh, from Newmarket. Uh, it's, as I say, it's, it's, it's cute because teachers uh, are quoted as saying that uh, they thought it was highly unlikely that he would amount to anything in life. Uh, I guess he was kind of a rambunctious uh, young man who really didn't uh, take to studies. Um, was really, really, I guess, gregarious and uh, had a way with, with people. Very, very curious uh, uh, individual. I know that uh, uh, several people, uh, biographers, have suggested that the reason why he didn't appear to be uh, much of a student in his early days was because he was uh, very, very bright. And, uh, and of course, as you know, uh, education back then, um, you know, if you were in, uh, in a, a elementary class, and let's say you happen to be 13 to 14 years of age, you quite likely would be in the same class with people who are four or five or six years old. And so uh, I guess it would be very difficult to, uh, to challenge yourself uh, uh, in your education. And so I guess he, he wandered off into his own little world. But I, I always find it interesting that a number of historic uh, people who went on to, to do great things in life uh, were uh, categorized uh, when they were young as being uh, not a very good student and probably not likely to succeed very well in, in life. And again, as I say, this building is still there. Um, so you should, uh, uh, when you can get out, you should go and take a look at it. It's now, uh, I guess, uh, uh, a rooming house. There's a number of units in there uh, that you can, that people are living in. But uh, as I say, essentially the building is, is still there and still uh, available for you to take a look at. When he did graduate from, from the grammar school, uh, he went off to uh, University of Toronto and uh, where he uh, enrolled in uh, the uh, legal studies and uh, he uh, graduated in uh, 1863 as a uh, receiving his uh, uh, his degree and uh, he was uh, called to the bar in 1867 so he became a lawyer. Now as was often the case with people who, who obtained their legal degree um, he found that he had a, a real interest in politics. Um, for those people who don't know um, Sir William was probably the consummate uh, liberal politician. Uh, he was, uh, had a particular interest in uh, uh, social welfare, I guess you would say, in, uh, in human rights. And uh, it's said from interviews that they, they did with him for the local paper that uh, he uh, was drawn to politics because he felt that uh, in that particular capacity he could um, affect change, uh, and he most certainly did over his years in, in, in government. Uh, the interesting thing uh, that, uh, you know, we have to remember, you know, obviously, you know, we were into worshipping uh, Sir William because he was a Newmarket boy and, uh, you know, we sort of are drawn to our own, but I don't think it really matters where you go uh, in this country. Um, people know uh, Sir William Mulock. Uh, they know of his accomplishments. Um, if you go to Ottawa, uh, you'll find that uh, he's embedded in, in so many institutions in Ottawa uh, because of uh, not only his longevity in, in politics, but also the fact that he was at the forefront of 
a lot of the major legislation that came in to, uh, uh, to effect uh, here in the country. Um, when he retired from politics, uh, the present uh, prime minister of the day uh, is quoted as saying that uh, uh, Sir William would be remembered as being among the fundamental architects of the uh, country, uh, which I think is quite a uh, an honor. Um, he was knighted, of course, uh, so his uh, uh, abilities and his uh, his knowledge was uh, was accepted around the world. Um, and as we go through today's presentation, you'll see that uh, he was involved in a lot of international um, work on behalf of, of the Canadian government. And uh, he was, in fact, um, sought out by other countries uh, for his expertise in a whole variety of areas and his, his judgment on, on issues that they were facing. So, uh, in 1870, uh, he, he married um, uh, his wife and uh, decided that he would, in fact, uh, continue uh, to uh, with the University of Toronto uh, while he looked at his possibilities of, uh, of getting into to, uh, the, uh, the legal field. Uh, and possibly uh, getting involved in politics. Eventually, of course, uh, he put his law degree aside for a little while, uh, well, not really a little while, for quite a while, and entered into politics. Uh, he purchased the Mulock Farm uh, here in, uh, in Newmarket, and I say Mulock Farm because that's exactly what it was uh, when he purchased it. Uh, his intent was that it would be a uh, an area where uh, he could indulge in, uh, in uh, experimental uh, crops and experimental techniques for the raising of, uh, of livestock. And he was looking for a place that uh, could be a summer home for him. He purchased it uh, from the uh, family of, uh, of Augustus Rogers, who was one of the first uh, uh, Quaker uh, settlers here in Newmarket. Uh, so in the purchase of the house, he, he purchased a, uh, an historic property. And we talked a lot about the, the estate in, in, the, uh, in the first edition of this, uh, this presentation. Uh, so I won't spend any time talking about it, but he, he purchased an historic property uh, with, as I say, the intent that he would uh, continue to live in Toronto and that uh, he would keep the farm uh, as a summer home and also as a place where uh, he could get involved in experimental agriculture. He finally decided in 1882 to get involved in politics and he was elected to the House of Commons. This is the federal uh, House of Commons as a liberal candidate out of North York, which was our, uh, our area. So he ran for our area and, uh, and he just kept being reelected. He was, in fact, uh, re-elected uh, in 1887, in 1891, in 1896, 1900, 1904, and he held his seat for 23 years, which is pretty impressive. Uh, a lot of things were happening in Canada, and uh, not only was he a member of Parliament, but he very soon uh, became a key member of, uh, of the cabinet of, uh, of, I guess, three prime ministers. He, uh, in many cases, was the first minister of a number of departments. So not only was he tasked with running the department, but he was uh, tasked with actually setting up the department um, within the government. So that gives you an idea of uh, the kind of respect that, uh, that his colleagues uh, held uh, him in. His first appointment uh, within the government We'll take a look at again. I, this is a picture of his house, uh, and uh, I think it's it's kind of interesting. I, I love the picture of him sitting in the in the horse and cart. Um, 
apparently, uh, as I, I, I mentioned in the first presentation, and I'll be mentioning more in this presentation, uh, when he was in Newmarket, and increasingly over the years, he, he spent more and more time here in Newmarket. Um, you know, he, he wasn't, uh, you know, hiding in the, in the, uh, on the estate. He was out uh, amongst the people of Newmarket. And, uh, you know, my grandfather told me that it was a very common sight to see him, uh, you know, going along the road in a, uh, in a cart and horse, um, headed down to do shopping or to talk to people, to meet friends, uh, to discuss politics, of course. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, you know, he was, uh, uh, I guess, a real man of the people and, and continued to be so until his death. So initially, uh, before he made his name in, uh, in politics, uh, he was simply known as Farmer Bill. Um, I think people were were amazed that uh, this man who was, you know, so highly educated, who had become a politician, who was making his name in Canadian politics, um, would be seen in overalls and, 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 and boots um, out working on the farm. But one of his loves was um, experimental farming. Uh, he became involved very early in uh, uh, the Agricultural uh, Institute here in Ontario, and he became interested in uh, new uh, techniques that were being uh, put forward. He was interested in uh, the, the experimenting with different uh, crops and with different ways of, uh, of, uh, of raising cattle and, and, and livestock. And uh, so he decided that uh, this would be I guess what you would call his hobby, um, but uh, as time went on, uh, he spent more and more time, as uh, I said, in here in Newmarket, and uh, this became, uh, I guess, somewhat of an obsession with him. Uh, for those of you who visited the property uh, when it was open, you probably saw that uh, you know he put in a whole grove of uh, black walnut trees. Uh, that was an experimentation of his. Uh, uh, these trees uh, were had been newly imported into Canada, and he wanted to make sure that uh, uh, his farm had uh, a large supply of these uh, these trees. Uh, of course, the joke that everybody talks about is that uh, he didn't really realize that uh, once you planted these trees, and particularly a large number of them, that nothing else would grow around them. Uh, they're renowned for uh, putting out a sort of a poison through their roots, which uh, uh, tends to kill all other vegetation around them, uh, which is probably the reason why the uh, the trees are all by themselves on the property. There's nothing else around them, uh, probably because of the fact that nothing else would grow around them. So anyway, uh, his first portfolio within the government was uh, as Postmaster General of Canada. He also was appointed to be a member of the Privy Council of Canada. and. Uh, this was uh, Sir Wilfrid Laurier who, who appointed him. Uh, if we take a look, he, he actually served in, in this uh, particular capacity from 1896 to 1905. Uh, during that period of time, he uh, got interested in uh, how our mail service worked. Uh, Mail service, and maybe your, your grandparents told you this, the mail service was very expensive uh, prior to, uh, to Sir uh, William Mulock getting involved in the postal service. And he originated the idea of uh, penny postage. Uh, basically, the idea was that uh, uh, people would be able to send their, their mail uh, in a, as part of a reliable system anywhere in the world uh, for a penny. Uh, which sounds like uh, very little money, but a penny was a fair amount of money back then, uh, because he felt that the postal service was one of those services that were uh, absolutely vital to a growing country, and he wanted to make sure that uh, that Canada had a uh, a viable uh, mail service. For those people who read uh, British history, you will probably no doubt uh, notice that uh, when the British uh, government decided that it would bring in penny postage, uh, they asked uh, the Canadian government if uh, Sir William Mulock could come over and could uh, help them with their uh, bringing in of their system. 
He also uh, uh, took his expertise to the United States and also uh, uh, consulted with the Australians when they uh, wanted to bring forth uh, uh, penny postage. So not only uh, did he bring penny postage here in Canada, but he also um, was involved in a couple of other countries and, and their development of, of uh, their postal system. In uh, 1900, uh, he was chosen by the federal government to be the Canadian representative um, to the uh, uh, federal parliament of Australia. So he, he created a, uh, a liaison with the Australians and uh, over his period in government, uh, he was a consultant to the Australian government. Um, the idea being that uh, he wanted to, to make sure that uh, the ties between Australia and Canada, which he felt um, had an enormous number of ties uh, with Canada, uh, he wanted to make sure that those ties stayed strong. And as we'll see in a few minutes, uh, those ties turned into quite a, uh, a project, which uh, he spearheaded uh, along with the Australians. Um, a little later. He then moved on to become uh, Canada's first uh, uh, cabinet minister uh, running the Department of Labor in 1900. He became the first minister of labor, as I say, and uh, was also responsible for bringing in minimum wage. Um, Previous to, to, to this period, of course, there was no such thing as minimum wage. Uh, so there were so many, uh, so many people who are working for almost nothing. Uh, child labor was, was particularly bad uh, here in Canada as it was in Britain and many places in the world. Um, so he, you know, he became uh, our, our minister of labor and uh, he decided that uh, what we needed to do uh, was engage in some social reform. And one of the first things he did was bring in uh, minimum wage. It's interesting, at this point, uh, he identified uh, a family friend's son, uh, who he thought uh, showed potential uh, for uh, uh, great things. Uh, that uh, family friend was Mackenzie King, who became um, our prime minister. Uh, but he brought Mackenzie King uh, into the uh, Department of Labor uh, and gave him the job of uh, going out and being his eyes in, in, the, in the community uh, and to advise him on how um, labor laws in Canada could be reformed. In 1902, um, he was uh, appointed to uh, the order of the King's commander of St. Michael, which most people know is usually the first step to knighthood. Uh, he was appointed by uh, uh, Edward uh, the Seventh, and uh, he was asked by the British government uh, if he would become involved uh, with a project that they had in mind, uh, which was the linking of Britain, Canada, and Australia. Uh, by cable um, underneath the, the ocean. And uh, Sir William Mulock decided that he would take on the task on behalf of the Canadian government. And he uh, was instrumental in uh, uh, the portion from Canada to Australia in uh, the laying of the cable and uh, bringing in all of the expertise uh, needed to, to, to do so. Uh, so that's a, another feather in his cap, so to speak. Uh, something that uh, uh, if you go on the Australian government's uh, website, uh, you will find that uh, they make mention of the part that uh, Sir William played in, in that particular um, endeavor. Uh, so we should feel very proud of that. Uh, I mentioned that, uh, that Sir William had this, this incredible um, interest in, in science, the arts, in, in all of the various things that are happening uh, all over the world. He, uh, through his uh, connections, uh, became 
uh, acquainted with Marconi, and uh, he thought, you know, this was an incredible invention, uh, the telegraph, um, and it was the telegraph that was going to make use of these uh, these underwater cables uh, between Canada, uh, Britain, and Australia. And uh, so he decided on behalf of the government that he would try and persuade Marconi to set up a, uh, a radio station um, in Canada, and he was successful in doing so. Uh, Marconi uh, came to Canada and set up a, uh, a station in uh, Glace Bay in, in Nova Scotia. And uh, that was uh, uh, the beginning of transatlantic communication between Canada and, uh, and the UK. What's interesting is that Marconi uh, became a friend of, of uh, Mulox, uh, we're told, and uh, you know we, we, we have documentation of Marconi coming, actually coming to Newmarket uh, and staying with, uh, with uh, Sir William at his home. Um, and my grandfather uh, always told me about uh, the fact that, that, uh, that the, uh, the telegraph was in fact uh, um, demonstrated uh, here in Newmarket, uh, uh, which was, I think is kind of interesting as well. Um, a brand new technology that uh, was new to the world. It was going to revolutionize uh, communication in the world. And uh, because uh, of Marconi's uh, um, interest not only in, uh, in Canada, but also uh, friendship with uh, Mulock, I guess he, he came and stayed with Mulock, which is, uh, you know, I think really interesting. Most people, when they think of Sir William Mulock, they think about the parties that he had and the famous people that uh, that visited his estate. And we talked a little bit about that in the first um, half of the presentation. Uh, but uh, these people came to visit because uh, they had met him through his many endeavors uh, all over the world and uh, and his interest in uh, in science. I think. Uh, I alluded to it in the first uh, presentation, but uh, through uh, Sir William's connection with the University of Toronto uh, and the fact that uh, that uh, he still had an, uh, a connection, I guess, with Bond Head, uh, he uh, became acquainted with Banting and Best, who were working on, as most people know, insulin and. Uh, you know, we have uh, pictures of uh, Banting and Best visiting um, Sir William Mulock's home. Um, Sir William Mulock made sure that the federal government uh, and the local business community supported uh, the research of Banting and Best into the discovery of insulin. So that's a perfect example of his interest in, in, in uh, revolutionary things that were happening around him. Um, even uh, when he was, was an old man, yeah, he was still uh, absolutely intrigued with all the new things that were happening. Uh, again, uh, you know, from an interview I had with my grandfather, he said that uh, uh, people always talk about the fact that uh, Sir William was absolutely fascinated with the, the car, with the, the, the coming of the automobile, and uh, wanted uh, the federal government to to take a stake in the in the car industry, thinking that it was going to be the next big thing. Um, so, you know, I don't think his his uh, his wonderment with what was happening in the world ever left him, which is which is of course a blessing for us. In 1903, uh, he uh, was involved with the the uh, eventual linking of the UK and Canada. Uh, through radio, as I mentioned. He also introduced uh, compulsory arbitration in Canada. Um, he, at that point, was uh, uh, involved in, uh, as I say, in the labor uh, ministry. And uh, it was his belief that we had to have some sort of system for solving um, disputes uh, labor disputes, and so he uh, was uh, the first minister to put forward the idea of compulsory arbitration. Uh, for those, depending on which side of the argument you're on, uh, he either was a visionary or uh, 
he brought uh, something into to the government's uh, toolbox that uh, you know we're sorry that they have, but uh, irregardless of how you feel, um, this was an extraordinary uh, development uh, and one of the first in the world uh, to do this. Uh, to have a mechanism to be able to handle labor uh, disputes. Um, it was particularly prompted by the fact that the railways at that time uh, had gone on strike. Uh, he wanted to um, solve the, the strike because, of course, at that point, the railways were the lifeblood, as uh, Gordon Lightfoot tells us. Uh, was the Lightfoot, uh, Gordon Lightfoot uh, tells us that uh, uh, it was what connected uh, Canada from, from coast to coast, and uh, Sir William uh, understood that uh, and wanted to make sure that we had rail service and so uh, he put forward the, the, the idea that uh, the government would, uh, would mediate uh, the labor dispute and uh, during that uh, period of time the, uh, the railway people would, would go back to work, the railway would uh, continue to work and uh, a resolution would be mandated by the federal government once they heard both sides of the argument. He also got involved in telecommunications here in Canada. The uh, federal government decided that it would set up a, a select parliament uh, inquiry into the phone system here in Canada. At that point, uh, the only um, uh, company that was providing uh, telephone service was Bell Canada and uh, they wanted to look into it and see whether uh, it was in the best interest of Canada to have just one country or one company that was hand handling all the telecommunications in the country. He also wanted to um, uh, see if he could uh, find a more efficient way of, uh, of uh, installing telephones uh, right across the country. Uh, the government got involved in an ambitious uh, I guess you'd say uh, project to to uh, to expand the the network, the telephone network here in Canada, and under his watch, um, Canada was able to to expand the the network of of, uh, of wiring across the country, uh, reaching from from sea to sea, uh, which was you know fairly impressive. Um, he came up with the idea of making sure that we had a public uh, system which was accessible uh, to the ordinary man from the street. Uh, he made sure that the price of a telephone call was kept low because he thought that it was an absolute uh, necessity that, uh, that Canada have a viable uh, telephone system given uh, the size of the country. Um, and the picture that you see on the uh, screen at the moment is the National Telephone System, which he founded, um, and uh, it's a cartoon that appeared in the paper. The other interesting thing um, that you see in the background is the, the railroad. Uh, he also was instrumental in making sure uh, that the railroad system was expanded um, so that uh, almost every community in Canada was accessible uh, via the railroad. Um, he made sure that the, uh, the railroad uh, was given subsidies uh, to encourage them to expand into areas where they hadn't been before. Uh, so I think it would be fair to say that he also could be uh, considered the father of the transcontinental railway system here in Canada. Also, most people will remember um, the uh, fact that, that he was involved in the uh, canal project, uh, which uh, you know they appropriately, I guess, have, have named the Ghost Canal, uh, which was supposed to link uh, a new market and new market industries uh, to Lake Simcoe uh, and to the larger Rideau Canal um, system. And uh, you know, it's interesting how history. Uh, over the years has revised its, uh, its initial uh, interpretation of events. When uh, uh, we were in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, and probably even uh, into the 40s and 50s, uh, this project was, was named uh, Mulock's uh, Folly. 
the belief was that uh, that the project was a stupid, stupid idea, uh, that uh, it would never have succeeded, that it was a, uh, a total waste of money, and uh, that it was a blessing when the when the uh, uh, Mr. Borden's government uh, came into power and canceled the project. Um, and uh, I guess this would have weighed quite heavily on uh, Sir William because it was really, when you think about it, it was the only um, black mark, would you say, on his name. Uh, and uh, from what I understand, he, he constantly um, spoke, actually railed against the decision of canceling the, the canal. Uh, his argument was that uh, he had grown up here. He knew that Newmarket uh, uh, was covered with uh, artesian wells. He knew that there would never be a problem with uh, the uh, uh, canal filling with water. Uh, he argued that the plan to build the, the canal, and for those people who have either heard my presentation on the Ghost Canal or read my article in Newmarket uh, today, uh, you know that um, uh, the canal uh, uh, was far better uh, plan um, as far as uh, the studies that were done and the technology that was used than the Rideau Canal. If you've ever seen a, uh, a diagram of the Rideau Canal, it looks like a, a, a huge uh, snake uh, going all over the place uh, as they tried to find water uh, to accommodate the Rideau Canal. Uh, the picture, uh, conversely, of the Newmarket Canal was uh, almost straight. Um, so you know, really, it was uh, it was uh, canceled, and I think we found that out, uh, as I say, from uh, the latest uh, uh, looks into it by historians. Uh, I think we're pretty much convinced that it was canceled simply because we had a new government, uh, and the government wanted to rid itself of any projects uh, that had been brought in by the uh, the old uh, regime, so to speak. Uh, you know, I I referred to the fact that uh, you know. Recently, the story has changed. Uh, I was involved five years ago. Uh, I was contacted by a group of engineers who were graduate students uh, from Canadian universities, and they had taken on as their summer task uh, the reevaluation of the, the Ghost Canal. Um, they came to Newmarket. Uh, they asked me if uh, I could give them a little background of what I knew. Uh, I was lucky in that I had grown up hearing the stories of the canal from my uh, uncle, George Loosby. And, uh, and I walked the, the area with them, um, and they were fairly close-lipped. Uh, they walked, and they got a, a feel for the land, and they said, uh, you know, we're, we're going to take a fresh look at this and, and, and uh, sort of get an idea of uh, what went wrong or why uh, it was canceled. Um, I'm very thankful to them because uh, when they finished their report, although they didn't give me a copy of the report, uh, they phoned me and, and gave me... Uh, an overall view of, of what they were going back uh, to uh, to the universities to say. Um, and uh, that was that uh, not only was this a, a great project um, that uh, most surely would have worked, but that most of the uh, propaganda, I guess, uh, I know that sounds like a, a very strong word, but most of the, the information that was put out by the government uh, the new government about why they canceled it uh, was in fact uh, not true. Uh, as I say, the first one was that uh, the uh, canal uh, would be short of water. There was no water supply uh, according to uh, to the government, and so uh, they would never have been able to get sufficient water. Uh, they pointed out the fact that uh, in all areas where uh, the canal had not been filled in, uh, that it was in fact filling up. Um, with water uh, naturally from the artesian wells uh, uh, that were underneath the ground. Um, and they had pointed out the fact that the, the Newmarket uh, Council and the, and the government had found it necessary to fill in the canals because of the fact that they quite regularly filled in with water uh, almost to the top, which would be 12 feet of water. Uh, so, uh, so that was not true. Uh, the other one was that uh, uh, they argued that uh, they were in fact building a canal which was going uphill uh, and uh, that in fact uh, uh, everybody knows that water is not going to flow uphill. 
their investigation showed that, in fact, uh, the elevation was not an issue, uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, the elevation was downhill uh, going towards uh, uh, Lake Simcoe, and that uh, uh, it most certainly would have worked. Uh, they had built three lift locks, uh, same sort of thing as they have on the Rideau Canal, uh, for those areas where there was a little bit of a, of a terrain uh, that they had to overcome. Uh, so, you know, I could go through this in length, but the reality was that Mulock was right. Um, and uh, if he was around today, I'm sure he would be vindicated by uh, recent studies and uh, the change in the way history uh, looks at the project. This picture that you see on the, uh, the screen is, of course, uh, the grand old man himself uh, sitting with our uh, Prime Minister, uh, Mackenzie King. Mackenzie King's first, uh, first ran for, for uh, federal politics here in Newmarket and area. Um, in uh, the uh, former writing of, uh, of Sir William. Uh, so this gives you an idea of how close the two uh, must have been. Um, Sir uh, William uh, used to have um, most of the uh, politicians, federal politicians, uh, come to, to uh, uh, his home here in Newmarket, uh, his estate here in Newmarket, uh, for meetings, and uh, they would come up here just to visit him. Uh, one of the frequent visitors was, in fact, uh, uh, Mackenzie King. Um, we everybody knows that uh, that uh, the future King of England uh, came here when he was the Prince of Wales and stayed with Mackenzie King because they had met um, in Britain and had become friends. Um, I don't want to go into a who's who of all the people that came here, but uh, my point in mentioning it is that uh, Sir William was, was well connected uh, uh, internationally, and uh, I think that is uh, in itself uh, quite intriguing. I remember in, I guess it was the late 1970s, uh, I was given the opportunity to go visit the Newlock Estate um, as part of a little team that my Uncle George Luceby had put together. Uh, he actually knew the people that were living uh, in the estate at the time. And uh, I was absolutely amazed at the library, which I understand uh, is no longer there. And I assume, you know, the family uh, over the years has, has taken it. But uh, I remember the lady who was our hostess pointed out the fact that he had first editions of Conan Doyle and, and Dickens. Um, and uh, the Conan Doyle, I remember because she opened it up and showed me on the first page was endorsed to Sir William Mulock uh, from, uh, from Doyle, um, uh, you know, indicating that, uh, that this uh, book was a gift from him. So I think that was, you know, it's pretty cool as well. This is a, a picture uh, from uh, uh, the CNE in 1930. Uh, by this period, of course, uh, uh, Sir William Mulock had officially uh, left uh, politics and he uh, uh, was just a private citizen or as much of a private citizen as uh, Sir William would ever be. Of course, uh, upon leaving politics, he, he began a, a new career and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, I always liked uh, the beard. Uh, this is the thing that that, uh, that I love about uh, Sir William. Uh, as soon as I see uh, uh, this beard, uh, I know exactly who it is. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, how many people are in the picture. You can identify Sir William from that beard. I think it's incredible. In 1906, uh, he uh, decided that he would uh, create a, uh, a royal uh, committee uh, which would oversee uh, the railway and telecommunications uh, in this country. Um, that was in fact um, a committee which morphed into uh, CRTC. So, uh, you know, we can add that to his accomplishments. He uh, had created or he did create uh, the uh, the organization which eventually would uh, would morph into the CRTC, which of course today uh, handles cable, television, uh, radio, all telecommunications in this country. Uh, so that gives you an idea of his foresight. Uh, you know, he saw the need for it 
and uh, he moved to have the federal government uh, step in and organize this. He eventually retired in, uh, from, uh, from politics. In uh, 1923, he became the Chief Justice of Ontario. So not bad for, for a guy who, uh, while he, he became a lawyer and certainly article, uh, had never used his, his legal de uh, degree very much, uh, all of a sudden he's appointed uh, uh, the Chief Justice of Ontario. This was, in, as I say, in 1923, and he kept that position until 1936. Um, and if uh, for those people out there who are calculating, um, since he was born in 43 and 1843, um, he was an old man when he became uh, the uh, Chief Justice of Ontario. Uh, but he'd still uh, go to work every day, still uh, uh, alert, and um, and still. Uh, interested in changing social justice in, in this country. The, uh, he also returned to his uh, connections with the University of Toronto. Um, I went to a presentation at the uh, uh, Historical Society and our mayor, uh, Mr. Taylor, um, spoke at length about uh, the part that uh, Sir William Mulock played in the uh, the growth, the establishment and growth of the uh, University of Toronto, and how uh, the University of Toronto became uh, an amalgamation of a, a lot of smaller uh, colleges uh, uh, to become the University of Toronto. Um, and he spoke about uh, the vital part that uh, Sir William Mulock uh, played in the uh, the uh, joining of all of these colleges in the direction that the University of Toronto decided to take. Um, he was the Chancellor of the University of Toronto, uh, which in itself is, is quite impressive. If, uh, if that was the only thing that you had done in your, your life, um, that would be pretty impressive. But this was just one of just a number of things that uh, Sir William took on in his life. And what's more imp uh, impressive, I think, is that he took on this uh, in the twilight years of his life. Um, so, you know, he was a uh, quite a vibrant man. Uh, you know, we must remember that uh, he lived to be 101 years of age, uh, which is an amazing uh, length of time for any human being to be alive. Uh, particularly amazing when you think of all the things that he, he uh, was able to, uh, to do in the 101 years of his life. In 1924, uh, as I say, he became the Chancellor of the University of Toronto, and he did that for 20 years of his life. So long after he was a politician, long after he had contributed to not only uh, the national um, scene, but also the international scene, um, he returned back to, uh, to what he originally had trained to do, uh, which was to be uh, involved in the justice system, and he uh, returned to his alma mater to uh, um, help to develop uh, the University of Toronto into what it is today, which is one of the leading universities in the world. But unfortunately, uh, we all die. And uh, in, uh, uh, I should show you this picture. This is a, a picture of Sir William as the uh, as a judge, as the uh, Chief uh, Justice of Ontario. Um, beautiful picture. Uh, as you can see, he's still got that uh, incredible beard, uh, which I just love. He, uh, as I say, he passed away in his 101st year in, in 1944. Um, and he, his funeral was actually held here in Newmarket. Uh, many of you, uh, you know, if you've uh, read my article, maybe you follow me on Facebook and you've seen the postings that I've, I've put on Facebook of the article from the ear about his, uh, his um, funeral. But, uh, you know, in the oral history uh, interviews that I've done over the years, uh, most people who are alive in, uh, at, that, uh, at that time say that Newmark has never, ever seen a spectacle like the, uh, the funeral of uh, Sir William. 
when you think about it, um, almost the who's who of, uh, of Newmarket politics uh, came to this sleepy little town called Newmarket to uh, uh, to attend the funeral of uh, Sir William. Uh, the uh, Sir William uh, was honored with uh, three uh, prime ministers who who, uh, who attended his funeral. Uh, one of which, uh, the reigning uh, uh, prime minister, uh, was Paul Bear. Um, so you know, even in death, he was uh, uh, renowned throughout the country. The uh, flags. Uh, flew at half mass across the country uh, to honor him. I get a little choked up because, uh, you know, we have had very few people uh, that I've uh, uh, sort of uh, read about in this country uh, that were played such an important part in our history and uh, brought uh, so much honor to our uh, our country and our community. So. No, it's fairly impressive. Of course, Newmarket was all draped in, in black, and uh, the funeral, as well as being attended by uh, the dignitaries, was also uh, heavily attended by the people of Newmarket. They were out in mass. And the thing that really, I think, uh, uh, amazes me is that uh, there's a minimum of security. Uh, when you think about it, uh, you know, the cabinet, uh, members of, uh, of the parliament, uh, dignitaries from around the world, as well as three prime ministers uh, were here in Newmarket, and the uh, uh, and there was a minimum of, uh, of of security. These people marched up Main Street um, to the cemetery here in Newmarket for the burial of uh, of the grand old man. Uh, so that's an event we probably won't see uh, repeated uh, for a long, long time. On the screen, you see uh, W.P. Uh, Mulock. That is his grandson. Uh, he followed in the uh, family footsteps, and uh, he became our member of uh, parliament here in uh, in Newmarket and area. Uh, and he uh, he served us uh, for a great deal of uh, of time. Uh, he shared his his grandfather's passion for. Uh, Human rights and, and and justice, and I think that's one of the reasons why he was returned uh, to Parliament, um, you know, repeatedly. He died young, uh, unfortunately, but uh, extremely uh, influential. And uh, the Mulock, well, in passing, I should mention that the Mulock family was also, um, you know, famous in so many other ways. Um, uh, W.P. Mulock's uh, son was, was, of course, Cothra Mulock, uh, who became, uh, I guess, one of the, the five richest uh, uh, people in North America. Uh, he was quite an impressive man, uh, I guess a little bit uh, non uh, or unconventional, uh, but uh, a brilliant businessman, a brilliant uh, um, Organizer, I guess, of of, uh, of things in our community. He uh, uh, was involved in the founding of uh, the Royal Alex in uh, in uh, Toronto. Uh, he, as a very very young man, uh, had inherited a great deal of money from the uh, from his uh, uh, Cothra side of the family. Um, Estimated to be about two and a half million dollars uh, uh, that he, he had inherited, and uh, unlike a lot of people, uh, he took that two and a half million dollars, and it's estimated that uh, he was able to, uh, at the time of his death, uh, he was able to increase that uh, fortune to uh, about uh, six or seven uh, million dollars, which is quite impressive for the time. Another uh, uh, part of the family uh, that became, I guess you'd say, famous uh, was uh, Alfred Mulock, who uh, founded the Red Barn Theatre. Uh, many of you may remember up in Cottage Country, there was a theatre uh, called the, uh, the Red Barn Theatre, and it was uh, it brought in local celebrities. Uh, 
an international stars to to do theater in the cottage country um, and uh, Alfred Mulock was one of the uh, uh, the founders of, of this particular uh, theater uh, the Mulock family uh, continued to sponsor um, all kinds of, of things throughout the country uh, particularly in the Toronto and Newmarket area um, so many people that I interviewed for my oral history um, interviews uh, talked about the fact that uh, that the Mulock family uh, would have a huge uh, community picnic uh, every every year um, they paid every cent for every cent of it uh, usually uh, it was held at the lake um, the uh, it, it was had entertainment games lots of food everything free and it was uh, it was part of the legacy of, uh, of Sir William and uh, for a number of generations his family maintained the tradition and uh, and held the picnic um, so you know I, I think that uh, uh, he certainly was a man uh, uh, of the community. Uh, as I said, uh, my grandfather uh, talked about the, uh, the very fact that uh, um, you would see Sir William uh, on the streets of Newmarket talking with people, uh, talking politics, talking farming, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, so I think we should be very proud that we had this, this gentleman as, as part of our uh, our community. He is in fact buried here in Newmarket and uh, when you can get out and, and about uh, you know I encourage you to go up to the uh, uh, to the Newmarket uh, Cemetery and take a look at the stone. This is his stone uh, that uh, uh, that marks his grave. Um, you'll notice that uh, uh, the stone is of Italian marble. Uh, it was uh, um, so the stone was was brought uh, uh, to Canada, shipped to Canada, and uh, the stone was was made uh, locally uh, for uh, Sir William, uh, which I, I a lot of people don't know that he's buried here. Uh, a lot of people assume that he's buried in Toronto or in, in some sort of national uh, cemetery, but he is in fact uh, uh, buried here in uh, in Newmarket. Here's a closer look at the inscription. Um, so, as I say, you know, head up to the uh, to the cemetery, local cemetery, when you get a chance, and take a look at this. This is a, a, a piece of uh, history uh, in the making. Um, it's interesting that with all the fame that he found internationally and all the fame that he found uh, nationally. That, uh, that he chose to be buried uh, here in Newmarket. Um, and I guess it's understandable because as I say, his, uh, his mother and her family were long established uh, family here in Newmarket. Uh, he loved it here. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, both today and, uh, and uh, earlier today when I, I did the first installment, uh, he uh, had originally planned for the home here in Newmarket to just be a summer home, uh, but he uh, very quickly uh, changed his plans and he spent more and more time here in Newmarket and, uh, and there came a, part, a point in his life where he just simply moved here to Newmarket. Uh, he loved it here, he loved the people um, and he was I think a, a local hero Unfortunately, it's taken the the, uh, the event of the town purchasing the estate to bring him back to the to the lips of uh, of the Newmarket community, which is kind of sad because uh, he was kind of uh, of a uh, a figure from our our history that was larger than life, but sort of faded from uh, from our memory. Uh, we do have a school uh, named after him in, in Newmarket, uh, but uh, I'm not so sure that most uh, people in Newmarket uh, have any idea uh, just how uh, important he was when he was alive, uh, how loved he was uh, internationally, and uh, how respected he was by his colleagues uh, uh, in the government. 
So I hope that you've enjoyed um, this presentation. As always, uh, you know, I, I have to thank uh, uh, people who uh, have contributed to not only this particular series, but in almost everything that I do. Uh, the information for this presentation uh, came from the New Market Era and the Toronto Star. Um, one great thing about doing uh, something on a man that is as renowned as, as Sir William Mulock is that there is lots of uh, literature on him, lots of books that have been written, uh, but he certainly uh, appeared in, uh, in all the papers around the world uh, you know, with, with some frequency, so uh, it wasn't very hard to, to uh, do some, uh, some data mining and, and, and find the information. Toronto Archives, of course, have a, a, uh, a wonderful collection of, uh, of uh, information on uh, Sir William, along with the uh, University of Toronto Archives, uh, who also have quite a, a collection. Uh, I frequent the Newmarket Library. Um, one of the things that's so difficult about this, this point in history where we're all sequestered in our homes is that I can't go down to the, to the library and spend my days uh, rummaging through uh, the history and, and genealogy section in the, uh, uh, in the basement of the library, uh, looking for new stories and new uh, things of interest. Um, I should confess that, uh, yes, I, I do these, these uh, you know, the articles and the walks and the presentations uh, and the tapings uh, for you to keep the history alive. But I must confess, I also do it because I just love learning more and more about our history. Um, I have, just like uh, Sir William Mulock, I have such an interest in, in uh, what went, came before. And uh, this was uh, installed in me by two people uh, primarily. Uh, in different ways. Uh, George Lusby, who was my uncle, uh, brought me into uh, his interest of history when I was very, very young. Uh, in the beginning, he would just tell me stories and would give me small tasks to do uh, to help him out. I would go with him on site when he would be sketching the local uh, buildings and uh, historical sites uh, so that we would always have them um, to remember. Uh, later on, as uh, I uh, grew a little older, he gave me uh, more and more um, jobs in, in doing research for him. Uh, and uh, I went to university and uh, history was, was one of my majors um, because you know, I just loved history. And uh, so my interest in history now, uh, I can contribute or I can a tribute to, to uh, George Lusby, who is an amazing historian, um, one of the, the elite, uh, along with uh, uh, Ethel Truella, who wrote the, uh, the definitive history of Newmarket, the history of Newmarket, uh, a little green book uh, that you may see floating around town every once in a while, certainly in the library, if you ever get a chance to go down and take a look at it, and, uh, and Terry Carter, who is and always will be the, uh, the father of, uh, of New Market history. Um, there was a, a period of about 15 or 20 years when uh, after the passing of uh, Ethel Tuella, when the, there was a real serious chance that the history of New Market would be forgotten, uh, that the stories would be forgotten. Uh, and uh, people like Terry Carter uh, kept them alive. Uh, almost single-handedly. Uh, my uncle George Lusby uh, was doing uh, uh, the sketches and he wrote some books, but Terry Carter as well uh, uh, wrote a number of books. But more importantly, he was the editor of the New Market Era uh, and he made sure that New Market Era published uh, uh, every edition, um, glimpses of our history. He would write articles himself. He would go into the era archives and pull out uh, stories uh, from the beginning of uh, of our uh, our village um, back in the uh, 1850s uh, and republish them so that people understood uh, the rich history that we had in this uh, in this uh, community. Uh, so as I say, yeah, uh, we all owe a, a, a gratitude to uh, 
to Terry Carter, uh, who single-handedly, as I say, or almost single-handedly kept uh, the history of New Market alive and uh, and passed the mantle to to so many other people who have, who have picked it up. You know, we, we have a, a historical society uh, that meets uh, every every month or practically every month in the year, who do a great deal to keep our history alive. Uh, colleagues uh, like uh, uh, Wes Plater, who uh, write articles, uh, uh, have written a few books and uh, have a, co uh, a column in the SNAP newspaper. Um, they, you know, people like that uh, do a great deal to keep uh, our history alive. You know, I try to do my part uh, through the various things that I do, whether it be the articles on New Market Today or, you know, the, the history walks or you know, the presentations that I do, uh, certainly the oral histories that I do and taping people for posterity. Um, you know, I think we're all trying to uh, carry on the, uh, the works of uh, those people that came before us. And I think we, in every opportunity, we have to thank those people for having something to pass along. And finally, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank all those people who uh, over the years, and I guess, boy, on, uh, on social media, um, it's been about 11 years. Um, in total, it's been about 30 years that I've been doing this. Uh, and so many people over the years have offered me encouragement, have helped me along. All those people who have allowed me to, to interview them, to tape them uh, recently, um, to save their, uh, their messages and their memories. Uh, you know, I have to thank them. I thank you today for for taking time out of your life to to take a look at uh, at this uh, uh, recalling of the uh, the Sir William Mulock story, and uh, I hope to to do a number uh, of other uh, presentations. I think they're particularly important this, uh, given the fact that we're all sequestered in our in our homes. Uh, uh, we don't know for how long, but uh, at least this will give you something to do, uh, fill in the time. Um, so I thank you very much, and uh, I hope to be back with uh, a presentation on Fairy Lake, on the history of Fairy Lake, um, in the not too distant future. In fact, I, I think I've got all the things together to start it, so you should see it appear uh, pretty soon. Uh, so thank you very much for all your encouragement. Thank you for tuning in, and I'm hoping that you have a, a great day, and please stay safe.